Okay, great. So yeah, I'll just start. Um, uh, this is a little bit the agenda. Uh, why circularity and why now? These were the photos that I was referring to uh, in India of the before and during the lockdown, um, the incredible decrease in pollution. This is the, the not ice that I was referring to, the laundry detergents. Um, and these are the photos of Venice. So the water in the canals is the cleanest that it's been for a long time. And I believe this is really important because this is the cleanest that um, at least my generation has seen the environment around us in our lifetimes. And um, I believe consumers are going to want this to stay. So the main question is, how do we keep the environment this clean while still um, you know, having a healthy economy and a healthy social life as well? We don't want to stick, stay inside in our houses um, forever. <laughs> and um, so the, the idea is that um, circular economy addresses these three categories. We can have a healthy economy and a healthy environment, healthy social lives, um, if we change a little bit our industrial system to be a bit more circular, um, as well as the cradle to crater perspective. So I'll dive a little bit into the background on what circularity is, as well as how cradle to cradle is related. So perhaps you've seen this diagram before. This is the butterfly diagram from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And uh, it's probably the most popular uh, image when talking about circular economy. And uh, circular economy contrasts from the linear economy in the sense that um, right now we're taking products from um, the natural environment, we're transforming them, and then we just set them aside as waste. Um, so what circular, the circular model does is to um, instead of having things as waste, to design that out and to really have uh, waste as an input into uh, the same industry or other industries. And this diagram is actually, um, or the, the, cradle, the circular economy philosophy is actually based on the cradle to cradle philosophy um, and the principles, um, which I'll discuss now. Um, so cradle to cradle is super similar in the sense that we want to design out waste. We want the waste to um, of one industry or from, from products to be food for another industry um, or new products. So the best example of this um, is nature. So in nature, uh, for example, the tree in the autumn when the leaves fall, um, this gets decomposed and uh, it goes into little nutrients. Uh, which becomes food for the tree again. So you have these endless cycles of nutrients. So Cradle Cradle goes a couple steps further um, that saying that we should also begin to power our industrial systems with clean renewable energy. So um, like the tree, it only uses uh, solar energy in order to grow and to uh, keep this cycle going. Um, we also want to celebrate diversity so uh, in the example of the leaf, um, it, like when the leaf falls, it doesn't just spontaneously decompose into the nutrients. Um, there's a system of microorganisms that is working to make sure that it gets decomposed um, and that the nutrients are actually bioavailable for that tree. So what we really want to do in this webinar today is to expand your idea of circularity. So not just including uh, the material, so in this case, the leaves, but also the entire system and the all of the other cycles. So the water cycle, the oxygen cycle, the carbon cycle, as well as the other um, parties that are involved that help these cycles continue. And we're gonna do that specifically for fashion. So it's super important to keep in mind um, the materials when talking about circular economy, but um, we also want to start thinking about the water, the energy, the carbon, uh, and the people that are also involved in this system. So now we're going to dive into each of the five categories. So the first one is material health, and this is really the, um, the, the star of the show in Cradle to Cradle um, and what defines it uh, separate from the uh, mainstream circular economy conversation. And the goal here is um, safe and then circular. So in the example of a tree, the, the tree isn't producing um, substances that are toxic for the, the environment around it. 
um, which is what we are doing today. And it's not really, um, material health isn't really a sexy topic uh, in fashion. It's not something that gets talked about a lot, but it is super important. It's becoming very crucial um, as uh, the European Environment Agency put in a circular economy uh, report in 2017. And also consumers. Uh, this week is Fashion Revolution Week. Consumers are asking not only who made my clothes, but now what's in my clothes. So um, the label that's currently in there that talks about the composition um, is not enough anymore. We need to um, go deeper and have more transparency of what's going into our products. So our recommendation, um, besides working with us, <laughs> is um, just knowing exactly what's in your product. So if you don't know what's in your product, then um, nobody else can know either. So um, what we actually do in the um, process of the Cradle to Cradle certification is we take an inventory of all the products, um, depending on the level, but um, we strive for 100% of the chemical composition up to 100 parts per million. So we start with a bill of materials, um, asking the manufacturer to fill in all the different components that go into a product. And then we go into the supply chain in order to gather that chemical information. We then assess it according to our methodology um, against different uh, 24 different hazardous endpoints. Um, and each chemical, each class number gets a rating A, B, C, X, or gray. So we really are trying to make sure that we only have A, B, or C. Oops. A, B, or C chemicals in the product, then it's considered optimized, and we try to phase out any X or gray assessed materials. So this is a really um, uh, timely process. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of work, um, but what you can do uh, today is to check out the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. Um, they have, uh, you can check out this website, they do have a registry of certified products. So if you click on the Cradle to Cradle or Material Health Certificate Registry, um, then you can filter on fashion and textiles, and you can actually find a whole array of um, accessories, fabrics, um, yeah, dyes, chemicals that are already certified, and you can begin to purchase those, and, and you already know that they are safe and healthy um, for people and the environment. Okay, and then uh, we'll move into product circularity. So again, um, so we're gonna divide this into three different areas. So um, sourcing, design, and systems. And yeah, as I just mentioned, it's super important that we inventory all the materials and screen for material health. So all of these categories overlap a little bit, um, but we really need to know what's going into the product. You also want to consider the idea of rapidly renewable materials. So this is defined as any material that has a growth cycle of less than 10 years. Um, in fashion, this in can include cotton, um, wool, um, wood, for example. Um, these are all rapidly renewable materials. One thing that you should consider is that not all rapidly renewable materials are alike. So for example, looking for certifications, conventional cotton is not the same as Gotts cotton. Um, there's a lot of chemicals that are involved that keep that goal of having safe and then circular materials involved. And they can also degrade the biological system. Um, same goes for FSC certified wood. Um, we wanna make sure that we're not tearing down um, ancient forests or um, rainforests in order to make our clothing products. So really looking out for certified materials when it comes to rapidly renewable. And also um, definitely use recycled material, but one caveat here is to make sure it's from a controlled or known source. So a big trend right now is um, the idea of using, for example, ocean plastic into our fashion products. And uh, this is a great initiative to get plastic out of the ocean. However, when you consider it, this is a giant soup of unknown substances. So we don't know the chemicals that are in there. We don't know if they're toxic or not. Um, and do we really want to start putting that on our bodies, on our customers' bodies? 
So, um, you know, striving for post-industrial waste, um, as long as you know that it, there's no harmful chemicals involved, um, or at least just asking these questions. So um, if you work with a manufacturer or with a, a materials provider, asking these questions of, you know, where did it come from? Um, what's the composition, if they know it, um, just to get more of an idea of, of the exact substances. And then we have circular design. So we do want to design our clothing to be durable. So we want to design high quality clothes that can last and um, have multiple life cycles um, or multiple users in one life. Um, that being said, we do want to keep the use phase uh, in mind because, for example, this absolutely applies to garments. Um, but for example, now we're, uh, we're producing a lot of these masks um, these single use masks in the Corona crisis, um, which are now ending up in the ocean. So these are, this is an example of products that we don't actually want to be durable. Uh, we do want them to decompose a little bit faster. So just keeping the use phase in mind when designing for durability. Um, also keeping in mind modularity or um, designing for disassembly. So there's a lot of uh, innovative solutions coming out right now. Um, from what I hear, none is perfect. So for example, we have uh, screw on buttons. So in the disassembly phase, uh, or when the time comes that the product needs to be recycled, you can easily unscrew the buttons and then reuse them. So that's a great example. Um, maybe it has some quality issues from what I heard, um, but just keeping in mind different ways of designing a product so that it's easy to take apart when the time, the com the time comes to recycle. Um, yeah, or that they can have multiple uses um, by designing for modularity. And you also want to keep in mind um, designing, you could be either designing for the technical uh, cycle or the biological cycle. So biological cycle is anything um, that you can afterwards that can safely biodegrade or uh, be composted. So anything that can be broken down naturally. Um, and anything that goes in the technical cycle is anything that needs to be mechanically or chemically recycled. So it needs to be processed um, by man-made equipment in order to reuse it. Um, and from depending on this, um, we think the ideal is to do both. So designing for the technical and biological cycle. Um, so in the case of denim, you know, recycling it as much as possible. And as the quality decreases, we can then um, safely compost our denim definitely a radical idea, but hopefully where the industry is going. Um, but there's still a lot of considerations. That's why the safety aspect is super important. There we go. So then we want to also think in systems. So, um, you know, if you're a designer or manufacturer, the product, um, you know, the thinking about the entire life cycle of the product, um, you know, once it leaves your hands or out of the door, um, still thinking about what's going to happen to it. Where is it going to end up? Um, and we really want to design for active cycling in mind. Um, so making sure that, you know, if you're a manufacturer, that um, that your clients, if it's a brand, uh, has a proper take back system so that these products are easily brought back into the system so they can be cycled. We also want to think about the circularity of knowledge. So um, as we mentioned, we want you to know what's in your product um, and a good way. And this is um, something that we offer. And this is going to be very important in version four of the Cradle to Cradle certification is the idea of a materials passport. So as I mentioned, consumers, you know, it's not enough just to know this little tag what's in the product. Um, we want to know a bit more. And it's also very important for, for recyclers that they know exactly what's in it. Um, as well as the safety aspect. So considering to keep track um, of, of the materials in a product with a materials passport, um, kind of a little storybook of where it's been, what's in it, the best way to recycle, um, if there is any cool innovation, um, any of that information to keep track of the knowledge in the product. And also considering digitalization. So there's a lot of cool initiatives out there um, that assist this knowledge transfer. 
Um, so Circular ID is one of them and Circular.Fashion in Europe are some of the bigger initiatives that are aiming to complete this cycle of knowledge and to increase the efficiency of, of um, garment recycling today. So this is a great example from one of our clients, uh, Raishbi. They're located in Karachi in Pakistan. And they recently, um, yeah, I think you can see that. Um, they recently had a fabric certified, actually the first cradle to cradle certified fabric at platinum level. So it took a lot of work, but it was definitely worth it. Um, so some cool aspects of this are that um, the chemistry is 100% healthy and safe. Um, it's considered optimized. It's made from 100% rapidly renewable materials. Um, in this case, Scott's cotton. And it's also designed to be recyclable. So one cool um, um, design feature, um, I believe Safdar might be on this call, um, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, so a lot of the times in denim, we use elastane to make a stretch. Um, but if you use too much elastane, more than 2%, this can make the recycling of the fabric very difficult because the elastane gets stuck in the, um, in the, pro in the machine. So, um, so what they did, so the design feature here is to um, not include the elastane, uh, but changing the composition of the fabric so that it actually stretches itself. The elastane isn't even necessary. Um, so that's one interesting innovation. Uh, that I want to share with you. And they also partnered with a client. So they work very closely with CNA um, in order to make sure that once this fabric is turned into a garment, uh, that the garment has um, a way back into the circular system. So CNA does have a take back system and they work with ICO in order to uh, make sure that the garments are recycled. Okay. So then we move into renewable energy and carbon management. And for this, we're going to introduce a new language of carbon. So did you know that 18% of the human body is made of carbon? And um, I included that fact because um, a lot of the times carbon and um, you know other greenhouse gases or the elements in greenhouse gases are very villainized. Um, so we think of carbon dioxide as something very evil, and it's not inherently bad actually we need it in order to survive um, plants need it for photosynthesis the only issue is that the the carbon is in the wrong place um, and so one interesting question that you can consider is how can we design products um, so that they actually capture carbon um, either in the product itself or back into the soil where it's safer So here we break uh, the idea of carbon down into three different types. So first we have um, living carbon. So this is, um, you know, the carbon dioxide that we need, um, that plants need in order to use photosynthesis, um, the, the carbon that we need in our bodies, um, and that actually the plants bring back down into the soil. We then have durable carbon which is um, when the carbon is trapped into our products, our man-made products. Um, so here, they're not actually inherently bad. Um, they're actually trapping and, and um, serving as a carbon um, kind of trap um, to keep them from being in the atmosphere. And um, a key factor here is to do all of these with renewable energy. So. We have the third uh, type of carbon, which is fugitive carbon. And this is the one that we really want to eliminate. So uh, fugitive carbon happens when these products, so in the case of fashion, um, garments or any textiles or any waste to make those products gets incinerated or landfilled. So when they're incinerated, the CO2 escapes uh, either into the air or back as acid rain into the oceans, um, or they can escape directly into the ocean through microfiber release, uh, et cetera. So this is just a quick description. So um, we're actually going to be hosting another webinar next week um, where our CEO, Ignacy Cubinha, will be um, talking more in depth about this. 
So uh, we're staying high level here and, and we're going to focus on some strategies for the fashion sector in specific. Yeah. So the first strategy is we want to eliminate this fugitive carbon. Right. So instead of we want to make sure that none of our products are being incinerated or ending up in landfill uh, from a fashion perspective. So making sure that we have these take back systems, that they're designed for recycling, keeping them in this loop is a good strategy to do that. Also to start being super, super conscious of the microfiber and microbead release that's happening into the ocean. Um, so this is very challenging. Um, there is obviously a, many solutions to this, um, but it is uh, a really big problem. So it's something to be aware of. And yeah, we wanna start switching to clean and renewable energies as soon as possible. Um, yeah, whatever and whenever possible. So the second strategy is to increase living carbon. So we can do this by using more plant fibers. So here you have some example, cotton, hemp, lyocell, banana, apple, fiber, and jute. Um, again, making sure that, um, that there are no, that they're organically grown, um, responsibly processed, that we're not using harmful chemicals in the process. Um, but yeah, whenever we use plants, we're putting, um, we're putting carbon back into the actual plant, but also into the soil. So the more plant fibers we use, the more carbon we can put, um, again, depending on how uh, the plants are grown. If we're using um, really artificial fertilizers, um, this is very carbon intensive industry. So if we do it organically, we're actually regenerating the soil. There's also the idea of regenerative farming. So we can use animal products as well, granted that the animals are treated well and um, that you know the wool and the leather are processed uh, with safe chemistry. Um, we can actually have regenerative leather. So animals can be raised in a way that um, that they actually their excrement is actually replenishing the biosphere or the the natural environment um, so that the soil can have more of a capacity for carbon and actually act as more of a carbon sink. Um, so some cool ideas uh, to to be aware of. And last but not least, um, so anything that's unavoidable. Um, so perhaps your, your company is switching to renewable energies, but it is a process. Um, we want to offset any unavoidable carbon emissions. So this is the last kind of uh, last strategy. Um, but you do want to quantify your emissions per product. So for the final manufacturing stage, this, is, um, this can be quite easy. Um, but right now, at least EU um, law is going to become more strict where we do need to know scope three emissions so the, uh, along the supply chain. And that's when an LCA is more handy, something to keep in mind. Um, also, another thing to, to keep in mind is when you are offsetting using standards um, or using projects that have appropriate standards. So in the cradle to cradle certification, we do accept um, carbon offsets from specific um, uh, yeah, certified programs such as the gold standard or the verified carbon standard. Um, this is two of many more. Um, if you're interested in the list, then just shout out afterwards and we can provide that to you. So this is uh, another one of our client, Voto Giuseppe. They have um, two yarns, the Naturalis Fibra and the Slow Silk Yarns, um, Cradle to Cradle Certified. And they are a company in northeastern Italy. Uh, and their facility is run on uh, completely on solar panels, which you can see here, and a hydroelectric plant. So um, they actually produce more energy than necessary with the hydroelectric plant. Um, and that energy goes to fuel the entire town where they're located, not the entire town, but to, um, to provide energy to the town. So a great example of um, regenerative manufacturing right there. So then we have the fourth category, water stewardship. And uh, this is the idea that kind of um, captured me uh, or convinced me of the Cradle to Cradle philosophy. Uh, I really love the idea that um, we can actually um, 
clean water in the process of, of making our products, we can clean more water um, or having water that comes out to be cleaner than any water that comes in. So we can actually do more good instead of, you know, less bad, um, making, making sure that instead of making sure that we're in compliance with the governmental laws, we can actually do better, um, which is something I really love. Um, so some things to consider, um, perhaps you're a manufacturing facility or a consultant who works with a, with a manufacturer um, or maybe you're a brand, but to start asking these questions um, either to your suppliers or to yourselves. Um, so keeping in mind, earlier we talked about the chemicals in the product, but we also want to be very mindful of the chemicals in the process. So um, you know, when we when we wash something out in the, the laundry phase, for example, um, those chemicals don't just disappear, they end up somewhere. And that's usually in the sludge. So if there's a wastewater treatment plant, um, those chemicals end up in the sludge of the water treatment plant and that sludge has to go somewhere. So we want to make sure that we're not um, that we're not uh, using toxic chemicals in the process either. Um, and yeah, this idea that you know, if there is an internal wastewater treatment plant at the facility, making sure or or striving to at least um, to provide water as a service. So trying to see compare the inlet and the ex uh, the exit water, and trying to make sure that the exit water is actually cleaner than the water that comes in. And if the water is if if the manufacturing facility is in a super scarce area, water scarce area, um, or in a place where the water quality is very high. Um, considering closed loop water systems. So endlessly looping the water system internally to prevent external st extra stress on the water system. And uh, so another of our clients, uh, G Star Raw, they just certified um, a gold range of sort of cradle to cradle certified gold range of denim products. And actually, in material health and water stewardship, they scored platinum. Um, and that was because here they did optimize their process chemicals. So we, we uh, did assess all of their, the chemicals that go into the process and make sure that they were A, B, or C assessed, safe for um, people of the environment. Um, and they worked with a manufacturing facility in Vietnam, uh, which is a water stressed area. And this factory did have a closed loop water system. Um, and I think the only water that left um, that left the facility was just through evaporation or something something cool like that. And there was also a really great example of industrial symbiosis, which I enjoyed a lot. So um, as we mentioned earlier, it's really important to keep in mind the process chemicals um, because what this company did was the sludge from the wastewater treatment plant, um, now that we know that it was safe and healthy, um, could be used as um, material to make bricks for construction for nearby. So it's a great example of um, using a waste from one industry as food for another. Um, this was still in a pilot phase, if I remember correctly, um, but just a, a cool idea that I wanted to put out there. And we also looked upstream uh, into the supply chain to make sure that all the, that the components were, um, or the, the places where the, for example, the fabric, um, the manufacturing facility was properly managing water there. So in this case, um, the fabric is from Artistic Milliners, and we actually had worked with them to certify the fabric first um, and to make sure that all water is properly managed there. Okay, and then we have the last category, last but not least, but um, it's social fairness. So um, for a long time in history, We've been, um, you know, in business that these decisions have been made with a small number of, of stakeholders in mind. Um, and now what we would like to do um, in, in the Cradle to Cradle world is to expand that circle of stakeholders interest uh, so that we keep in mind um, not only, you know, the business, but the consumers, the environment and, you know, anybody else involved. So there are four different qualities um, that we would like um, to include into a, a socially fair um, uh, fashion and, and textile industry. So the first one, obviously fair. So what do we mean by that? Um, 
So three things that are very important, no child labor, uh, no forced labor, and um, I'm blanking on the last one. And oh, living wage, yeah, of course. Um, so making sure that um, the manufacturing facilities that, um, that we are not just the manufacturing facilities, but all on the supply chain, um, that we are treating the people well. And um, at least in cradle to cradle, we do that by making sure that the um, in the supply chain there is um, that there are codes of conduct, uh, codes of ethics for the manufacturing facility, but also for their suppliers. Um, this is super important. We also want to make sure um, that we are being inclusive and diverse. So again, celebrating diversity. Diversity brings resilience to our social system. Um, and a really cool example of this. Um, is again, Rajbi, our one of our clients. Um, they have a goal to include, um, to have a, a twenty percent of people uh, in their workforce. Uh, that oh, you can just mute your phone, your microphone. That's great. Thanks. Um, yeah, to include uh, transgendered people. So uh, in Pakistan, there's a big population of transgendered people who um, have very risky jobs. Um, so Rajbi is providing them with safe work and bringing this at-risk population um, and including them into the mainstream life. Um, another really important value or aspect of circular economy in general is collaboration. So in order to complete the circle of all the different stakeholders involved in a fully circular fashion and textile system, um, we need to collaborate. So competition is the old way of working. Um, it's not gonna work here. It's not gonna work for, for the future. So really making sure that we keep an open mind um, and making and being as collaborative as possible. Um, and, and when we are collaborative, that's when innovation can breed. So we can come up with new solutions, um, a lot of creativity, in order to find um, solutions to problems that, that we're facing today. And finally, transparency. Um, this is, we, we really want the system to be as transparent as possible. This is what consumers are asking for um, during these fashion revolution campaigns. Um, you know, the fashion industry has been so secret and so competitive for so long, um, and people are asking for it to be more open and, and more collaborative and for that knowledge to spread in order to have that circular system, we do need that knowledge to go full circle as well. Okay, so we're coming up to the end of the presentation. I just have three main takeaways um, before I start to answer any questions. Um, so the first one is um, that circularity is more than just materials. So right now the conversation, the mainstream conversation is very um, focused on, on circulating materials um, but we want to consider more of the different cycles in when we are designing for circularity. And yeah, thinking in systems. So a product is not just a product. It's a whole system involved in order to get it from, um, you know, from the, from the field to the manufacturing facility, to the brand, to the consumer, and then back. So really considering the whole product system when designing a product. And keeping in mind, every company is different. So um, these examples that we've been giving today are, you know, the best of the best, um, really inspiring examples. Um, but we do work with all kinds of companies to uh, help develop a roadmap. So trying to help every company get to that point, um, starting wherever you are today. And yeah, have a great day and um, hope to stay in touch and stay safe.